Hey there, I am going live with Dr. Paul Anderson in just a moment, and we're gonna be talking about vitamin C and other things that we can be doing to support our immune system currently. Now, the first thing I gotta say about all of this is that nothing that you hear today should be taken as personal or individualized medical advice. And in fact, everything we talk about, we're not making claims that this can treat, prevent, or cure coronavirus. So I just wanna be crystal clear about that. And if you hear anything and you're thinking, Maybe I want to start that. You want to talk to an expert in natural medicine. And so I'm going to bring on Dr. Paul Anderson. He is a clinician in Washington. And he's also the guy who taught me a whole lot about medicine, including IV nutritional therapies. Hey, Dr. Paul Anderson, how are you today? How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Uh, you know, all things considered, I think every day I wake up, I have a moment where I'm like, you have your health. You're doing well. Be yeah. grateful. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. How's it going up in Seattle? Um, well, it's uh, it's still pretty uh, pretty rough here with uh, the virus. Kind of like kind of like New York. Only you know, our, our, they beat us now numbers wise. But um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, mm -hmm. So so all in all, things are good. Uh, we have part of our family here at our house, and we're just staying close to home and doing mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah I think it's it's all of us you know I uh, coach practitioners and I've been doing telemedicine for seven years and now that everybody's yeah. jumping on this I'm like <laughs> I can help with this this is like when I have you know when you have a clinic in the bay area and you're treating all these people at google and facebook and no one wants to drive anywhere throws yeah. you into it pretty quick so yeah. I want to first start with like who are you so people know who you are because my audience you're going to be brand new to them well, uh, so welcome, audience. My name is Dr. Paul Anderson. I'm from Seattle, Washington. That's uh, where I am right now. And uh, I have a clinic there also, though most of my time is spent uh, teaching other physicians about lots of different things. Um, probably our topic today, so I just looked this morning and I've got seven new interviews between now and Friday. So. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I hope I'm not mixing up topics, but I think our topic today, uh, I've taught uh, physicians for a long time about the intravenous use of nutrients. Mm -hmm. and, um, so we were really used to intravenous use of drugs and hydration, things like that. Nutrients, not so much. Um, so I've been doing that a long time. Then you fast forward to a few years ago, I was involved in a National Institute of Health study with cancer patients using IV vitamin C and a whole bunch mm -hmm. of other very, very sick folks. Uh, and then when COVID came out and then they started saying in China they were going to use IV vitamin C and we were already using it here for sepsis and other things, uh, there were a lot of questions. So I did um, a, a big worldwide uh, uh, update for physicians on that and uh, uh, updated on w what they're actually doing in China, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I think uh, it's important for people to understand that you're actually in contact with the researchers who are actively studying IV vitamin C. So right. you guys, he's talking with the researchers in China and bringing that information to the U.S. docs. Yes, uh, talking electronically, but yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I was able to do, which was really good because um, so, so many things get like, you know, it's like the old game telephone. If you tell somebody one thing and then it's three times, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. You see news reports, sometimes they're pretty close to what's going on. Sometimes they're, they're kind of not. Now that we have U.S. hospitals actually doing this, <clears throat> we get a little bit faster feedback on what they're actually doing. But I was able to get the actual protocols from the Chinese doctors and, and some mm -hmm. Etc. So um, I think that is really important, though, because sometimes the tech, the terminology, not so much technology, that's thrown around is a little bit confusing around IV vitamin C. So mm -hmm. I thought, um, uh, yeah. So I have a lot of really current information, uh, and also some evolving information. So one of the things people ask is, well, so they have published one uh, initial update, and it's an expert panel. So it's not like one person saying this. This is a, over 50 experts all got together and agreed on what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And vitamin C was just a part of it, but it was an important part amongst all their other hospital policies to keep people alive. Being that they were first with cases, they've had the longest time to try different things. So I think they are actually 
you, you know, a little bit ahead on some of the technology. So uh, what I was thinking today, because there's so many different ways this could go is, what what would help you guys the most? <laughs> yeah, well, you guys are welcome to drop in your questions. And while you do that, you know, the first thing that I actually, I think we should talk about is that we're seeing a lot of doctors who are dismissing nutrient therapy herbs. And the thing I keep reminding people of is they have no clinical training in this. Mm -hmm. So they're making, they have opinions, but they actually don't have expert opinions. And it's really important to understand that because vitamin C, the first thing that you hear is, well, it's never been shown to be useful for the common cold. And it's actually like, well, if you get into the research, there, there is, it has, but you know, the, the problem is, and I think this is something for people to understand is that, you know, when we look at vitamin C and I'd love to have you speak to this, it's when people have been using it, that it's been a regular dose, not when, okay, all of a sudden I'm sick, I have the common cold, let me take, and then they usually look at like 200 milligrams of vitamin C, which is yeah. not much vitamin C at all. And so to understand that there's a lot more going on to this than you're probably hearing in the news and hearing from other doctors. And so let's talk a little bit about vitamin C. And again, guys, I'm just going to say we're not making any claims about prevention or treatment or giving you individualized medical advice. If you are interested in trying anything we speak about today, you need to contact an expert in natural medicine, someone who actually understands this, and ask them if it's right for you because there's no one size fits all here. Yeah, I I think uh, and I on uh, the the two thousand interviews I've done in the last two weeks that <laughs> keep coming yeah. back to is you know and and I think it's important and you make the the point really well but I just want to say it too because you know how people misquote things um, the most important thing is whatever you think you want to do in the so let's say it's something like this find somebody who actually does. IV vitamin C. Don't don't mm -hmm. just go to anybody. If you are interested in uh, some of the traditional Chinese medicine prevention things that they're reporting out of China, go to somebody who does TCM. Don't don't ask somebody who doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so it's so critical. And, and what I normally tell people is, I, and this is not a slam on primary care doctors, but they're not expert in these areas. So they're yeah. if you're going to ask them about vitamins. They're not going to be able to guide you unless they've done a lot of study in that. So, But if you have acute respiratory distress, then you go see that. Right, right. <laughs> There's a time and a place yeah. for everyone. Yeah, at, at, at the point where you are having trouble breathing, uh, that's when you really need to have the EMS and, and that whole system. So um, I think that an important thing about vitamin C to keep in mind is, and it works with a lot of other things, but it's, it's, it's sort of unique in its group in that we as humans, other animals can make vitamin C when they get sick, they make more. We can't, we, mm -hmm. we don't have that capability. And so one of the things that happens and why it relates so much to say respiratory distress and sepsis and other really, really bad things in hospitals is the sicker you get, the more you burn up these water soluble things. And especially mm -hmm. by the where you're not able to make it, you, you would have to eat it or take it or whatever. The sicker you are, the lower your levels get. And so by the time you get really sick, your cells are really deficient. And then what happens is, and they've actually looked at this to try and, because they're trying to figure out, okay, why would it help in sepsis? Or why would it help when we have respiratory problems? It, it kind of comes, there's a lot of reasons, by the way. But mm -hmm. one of the things that comes back to is in your cells, when you get into respiratory distress or sepsis or these other really bad things, if the vitamin C levels keep dropping, the other antioxidants that keep you from being inflamed get less effective. Mm -hmm. And so you might still have them around, or you might not, but if vitamin C goes out of the picture, they all slow down. And so you get more and more inflamed. And if you've been, you know, if you read about like the worst case scenario, when you're in the hospital and the ventilator doesn't work because you're so inflamed that you can't move air, um, that comes from a, a real big imbalance in inflammation and kind of anti-inflammation, which is always mm -hmm. about. So vitamin C fills a really important role. And what they did, and this is another thing that I've had a lot of interesting conversations the last few weeks with American doctors who do vitamin C IVs, what they did in China, for except in the real sick, like they were going to die and they had to try something, people. In the intensive care setting, uh, they 
they had really two stages. One was people who were moderately stable, but they had to be in ICU. And then the other people were not stable and they had to be usually on ventilators, et cetera. And they took two, two doses, but instead of giving like we would do in a clinic where they, you give maybe a big dose in the morning and then let them kind of work on that all day. Mm -hmm. What they would do is they just had a continuous flow of vitamin C into the person that never stopped through the And to clarify time. for everyone listening, this is IV vitamin C. Right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this is intravenously given. And so the American doctors say, well, that doesn't match what we do where we give them a whole bunch in the morning. And, you know, well, two things. One is these people are in a hospital and they're not going anywhere. But mm -hmm. the thing that, that the doctors over there who proposed doing vitamin C IV said was, in a real sick person, you may be better off just constantly every hour they're getting some. And that's mm -hmm. the first things they did. And what they saw was, so, and again, the, the statistics are evolving with this, but the early ones that we have from the doctors on this expert panel are the facilities that were seeing these patients where they did vitamin C, they had a 350 plus COVID patients in ICU. 50 of them got this continuous vitamin C infusion at this mm -hmm. point in one facility. And uh, of the 50 that they did this with, they not only none of them died, which was really good, yeah. uh, but also there were no big side effects at all. And uh, they were in the hospital for three to maybe five days shorter amount of time. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things that got the hospitals in the U.S. interested is if we shortened three days on everyone's hospital stay, think of how many beds and how many, you know, how much equipment we could save. So it is important to know that in if you get to the point when we can talk about the other ends like prevention or recovery when you're not in the mm -hmm. hospital, but if you're in the hospital and you need this, they're generally going to be giving it to you in a in an IV. Either uh, every twelve hours you get sort of a booster or a continuous IV. Mm -hmm. Intravenously, it just gets in you faster, and it allows it to get to the cells and calm them down faster. And that, mm -hmm. that's a big important thing. So there, right now, we're talking about in the hospital, but there's a role also for say oral use in the preventive or recovery phase that we can get to later too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to highlight for people to understand like what you were talking about with antioxidants and how they work together. So you guys, I have a whole video on YouTube talking about the necessity of vitamin C for helping vitamin E do its job in the lipid bilayer and how the cells become compromised in the actual layer of the cells when you don't have sufficient vitamin C. And so it's not just about does and this is the reductionistic uh, mindset we have to walk away from is does vitamin C actually elicit a direct effect? No, like you know, that's we need to go broader in that expansion of our understanding and also understand that you know, there have been studies showing that the people with end stage organ failure are completely depleted in antioxidants. So that's what uh, you know, I just want people to bridge that together about what you were talking about there. And I know I'm seeing the questions come up. What about oral vitamin C? What about liposomal vitamin C? And what about IV vitamin C? So as we highlighted here, IV vitamin C is what's being used in the hospital. There are clinics that are using it. Please vet your clinics because if somebody decides to pop up tomorrow and they just decided, oh, I know how to do IV vitamin C, yeah. like vitamin C is not going to cause harm unless you have certain genetic predispositions. And only a, a natural expert is going to be able to help you with that. So you're going to be looking for a naturopathic physician, um, possibly a functional medicine physician who is trained in IV therapy as well. Um, but I just want to caution people because we are seeing the craziest stuff pop up there. But let's talk about oral vitamin C, liposomal vitamin C, how it applies for prevention and in the recovery stage. Yeah, so um, one of the one of the nice things with this this update I did a few weeks ago for doctors was there there's some new information that sort of confirms what we've been seeing clinically for a long time about oral absorption of vitamin C. So if if you go back to Linus Pauling and then some the OG people, <laughs> the, around the you know the the start of all a lot of this not not everything but the start of a lot of it. Um, they would, especially when you were ill, recommend that you throughout the day just took vitamin C and increased until 
you have loose bowels, basically. They call it bowel tolerance dose. And people would say, well, you know, if you look at a physiology or biochemistry book, we maybe absorb two to 500 milligrams a day of vitamin C from our food. So why would I take more than that, right? Well, the problem we always had was when people got sick, they would be absorbing a lot more and they would have no bowel problems at real high doses. As they got better, they would take less. So in 1981, a, a, a former uh, a mentor of mine and colleague, Dr. Cathcart, wrote a, a scientific paper talking about bowel tolerance dosing during illness and all this because not everyone can get to an IV. And it does work and we see it happen. Well, literally the day before we were going to do the uh, webinar, a a paper came out um, that uh, showed they actually did blood levels after taking oral vitamin C. And what they showed was is that, yeah, it's not like an IV where you can give a whole bunch and get your blood level way up, you know, for a long time, but you indeed can get your blood level way higher than we ever thought that you could. It's just no one had it, you know, really well. So I say all that to say, and this is kind of what they're saying. Uh, definitely the, the Chinese doctors are saying as far, because think about what what's going on there. And they're, they're getting on the other end of their, their at local epidemics, but they tried to do everything to keep people out of the hospital possible because their mm -hmm. hospitals were maxed out. So they were looking at two things, really traditional Chinese medicine and vitamin C orally in the prevention stage. Or, or just mitigating symptoms. And then in the recovery phase where you're real sick, but you've survived, you can't just be real sick and stay there. You have to do things to help, you know, your, your organs recover, et cetera. So oral vitamin C became sort of got in the news that way. What people can work with their natural medicine expert and talk about is this idea that Pauling and Cathcart and all these guys wrote about, which is in the prevention stage, it's not the only thing, but vitamin C, we don't make it, it's water soluble. So what we use today, we use, and then it's gone pretty much. Mm -hmm. You can take it and other nutrients in that phase, or if you're just exposed to, I mean, there's way more than COVID-19 out there right now. There's a lot of other bad things. Super out there. important to, to share that. Yeah, yeah. it's not, it, this is not the only thing we're up against it, right now. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a, a time of year when there's lots of things out there. And, and so you can do things to at least maximize your nutrition that your body just can't do for itself. So the first thing that I usually tell people to do is um, because almost everybody eats every day, you, even with intermittent fasters, almost everybody eats every day. Uh, you can now go online pretty reliably and use a university site or something, but you can find nutrient values of foods. And so the first thing you want to do, because you're going to be eating anyway, is try and eat foods that have all of these good nutrients that people talk about, whether it's mm -hmm. vitamin D or zinc or other trace minerals, et cetera. And then on top of that, if you do supplement and you're working with somebody who's a professional and can help you with that, vitamin C, because of this water-soluble nature and because every day you need to sort of boost it uh, when you've got all these nasty bugs around, um, you can take it kind of regularly in that respect mm -hmm. and your body will absorb it and use it. So this, this old idea that's very commonly thrown back at uh, other folks in uh, North America, especially that, well, you only absorb two to 500 milligrams. So it's pointless to take more that actually doesn't pan out in, in sick people. That's just yeah. not, not how it works. And in, even in some of the sepsis and IV vitamin C hospital studies, they've shown that, yeah, when people are getting sick and decompensating, they're going to die, their levels of their antioxidants are dropping, as you said, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then you get organ failure and all the bad things. So if before you need to go to the hospital, you can do things to maximize your nutrition and then supplement it uh, if you need to, that's a, that's a better way to do it. Now, people also, and something interesting from the research was um, they looked two different pieces of research. One looked at oral uh, kind of plain vitamin C, ascorbic acid, um, which is what I take because it doesn't bother my system or whatever. Mm -hmm. I put it in my water, you know, three or four times a day. Um, and it tastes a little bit lemony, basically, because um, it's an acid. Um, they looked at that and the absorption was actually quite good. Uh, mm -hmm. 
then a separate group looked at liposomal vitamin C and liposomal is, it's sort of like vitamin C in a little envelope that kind of helps it get inside of people. Liposomal anything usually absorbs better uh, than say regular things. When it comes to vitamin C, it's, it's maybe a little bit better. They, they never tested them like head to head. So it's a little hard to look at, you know, mm -hmm. this research and this research and really say, but what, what you find is there's, there's two things. One is liposomes are hard to make. So you want to, you want a really good quality liposomal anything, or, or it's not going to be an actual liposome. The next thing is, is that usually I'll have people start with plain, you know, after the diet, things and find out what foods have all this stuff in it if they're going to do vitamin c i'll have them try just plain vitamin c because it's the mm -hmm. most cost effective it's easy to take most people do fine if their stomach is upset by it some people who have tendency to ulcers other things will be sensitive will uh before there was liposomal vitamin c and stuff we would use either like uh esterified vitamin c like ester c mm -hmm. or buffered vitamin C. Those absorb a little bit less just because they're being kind to your stomach, but they're still really good. And, or we would have people now try liposomal vitamin C. Um, the claims about how, excuse me, how much more it's absorbed than plain vitamin C. Again, it's kind of like a sick person absorbs more than a healthy person. Yeah. Liposomal vitamin C in a healthy person, you know, versus a sick person is probably a little bit different. But there are some people that's the only kind they tolerate, and that's great. That's mm -hmm. um, the bottom line is getting some in, so that you uh, kind of hedge these other problems that are coming up off. And something I think that's really important for people to think about, because right now, you know, if you, unless you are not looking at any any media at all, we, what you're hearing is not great messages about. COVID-19, which is, we need to know about it, and it's not, not going great out there in some of the hospitals, but uh, since, you know, November or October, there have been a lot of other viruses floating around, a lot of other things that sort of assault us, and what, what we often forget is most people are not bothered uh, symptomatically by a lot of respiratory problems, mm -hmm. because your immune system works, they're just sort of hanging out. There's some atypical bacteria. There's a lot of virus that just, just hang out, but they don't make most people sick. If you have these hanging around and then you get hit with, say, influenza A or, or COVID-19 or some big thing, suddenly the other guys become more of a problem. Mm -hmm. So they've been there without you really knowing it because you think, well, it's cold and flu season. And yeah, I felt bad for a couple of days, but now I'm better. If you're a kind of carrying a lot of these things, your immune system is sucking up these water soluble things like vitamin C and zinc and selenium and other trace minerals, et cetera. And so then by the time the bigger, nastier virus comes around, you're depleted, you don't know it. And then it's like, boom, you know, it has a like an open door into you. So prevention is, it's more than just say one or two things, but, but prevention's also like we don't realize how close often we are to, you know, the big ones. So to speak. If we get exposed and we're run down by these other things, we're more likely to get a nastier version of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a really important message here to understand um, is that prevention is a personal responsibility. Like preventing this, yes, the only way we know to prevent this is to not come into contact with it. Mm -hmm. However, if you do... The best thing we know right now is that a healthy immune system can help you overcome it. And how do we get a healthy immune system? Well, it's those super sexy things like sleep and exercise and yeah. keeping your stress in check. You know, this yeah. is stuff where people are always like, oh, right. the stuff my mom told me. Yeah, the stuff your mom told you. But it's also interesting when you look at people who are recovering, they were actually, and this is what I've seen with my patients, what I've heard from colleagues, People who had already started immune supportive protocols just because they were going into cold and flu season have actually fared better. And of course, you know, we have to have more research to understand, you know, the, the, the truth in all of this and, you know, who it works best for. But, you know, we know in the Pacific Northwest, it's dark in the winter. We're putting people on vitamin D because they need that. We know that's immune supportive. There are people who started their herbs because, you know, they know that every cold and flu season, 
they get hit with stuff. So they do things preventatively. And, um, you know, this is something I think would be a good point to highlight, like, you know, in Korea, there, let's talk a little bit about what are the differences in terms of what we're seeing in Korea versus what we're seeing in North America? Yeah, um, well, there's a couple of things in Korea that were immediately different. Um, and and I, I have uh, uh, physician colleagues in Korea that I knew from before from doing lectures and things over there. So when when this all started and we started to see a couple of these differences, I got a hold of them and just said, well, A, is what I think going on going on and B, what are people doing? And there's a couple of things that were knowing the Korean system, it made more sense. But one thing was they, uh, because of the uh, the laboratory technology companies that are in South Korea, they have the ability to do viral testing and they're, they're one of the world experts in it. So they started testing everybody immediately. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as they could sequence the virus, they had a test for it. So they're, they started testing 10,000 a day and then 20,000 and that they're just, so one thing is knowledge. And that was, you know, we're going to test as many people as we can. We're going to have people self-isolate if they're positive. We're going to have people use um, hygienic controls if they're negative, just so they don't, you know, transmit. So testing and isolation was one thing. And they did it early and they did it in a big way. If you think about like, you know, I'm in Seattle where we believe the first case was and then there were more. Uh, and then it got really nasty in certain areas here and a lot of deaths, unfortunately. Um, we didn't really have a lot of testing until a few, really a few days ago. Mm -hmm. of it, you know, so there, so there's a lot of unclear cases of, well, it might have been that or it may be something else. In Korea, they have this big data set. But the other thing that my uh, colleague told me, because I asked about two things. One was social distancing or physical distancing. And the other was, I know that Korean population is a little more open to just doing preventive natural things, like mm -hmm. just part of their culture. So I asked about those two things. And he said, yeah, he says, people, <coughs> excuse me, uh, by the way, hydration is a really important. <laughs> I know. I was just going to take a drink of water because every yeah. time I cough, like my husband in the house is like, why are you coughing right now? I'm like, right. people cough. <laughs> like, it's a it's thing. A, and the other yeah. day I was eating chips and I choked on a chip and I had a coffee fit. He's like, what's going on? <laughs> I'm like, people, people choke on food too. It, so it, things it, that happen. It is, yeah. It's, uh, so people who are doing these interviews and you cough, people are suspicious immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, so please drink water, people. Um, but um, so the two things, though, that he said, aside from people were, and I think this is maybe a little better than most Americans do, he says, if, if they tested positive or they had family members, they, they isolated very well and very quick. So that, mm -hmm. but he says, the other thing is, and, and basically we went back and forth about this a little bit, but he said, without government telling them what to do or anything, he said that the use of two things increased immediately. One were just natural uh, nutrient things, the water-soluble nutrients we're talking about here that help with your immune system. And he says, just based on the sales of those things that they're, you know, everyone's taking them. Uh, and then uh, the other thing was in, in Korea, they do something almost very similar to traditional Chinese medicine called traditional Korean medicine. Uh, and there's reasons they call them different things, obviously. But he said uh, that has become very popular because it, I don't know if people know this. South Korea and China have a lot of trade that they do, unlike us in China. There are whole hospitals that, that are just for Chinese medical tourism, basically. Over mm -hmm. there. So they're very close there. And when the reports came out about traditional Chinese medicine being great for keeping you out of the hospital or recovering, they just started to to use that a lot. So it's you know diet, nutrition, and then and then a lot of these additional just natural things. And I, I think both knowing who had who more likely had it and having them isolate quicker, big difference. Yeah. And then a lot of these just things that that they did naturally with their own you know diet and supplements. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Which, you know, is why I wanted to bring it up, because there's been a lot of conflicting information where you are seeing really smart medical doctors saying nutrition and lifestyle does nothing. 
And that's not totally accurate to be saying. Like, we actually, just because there's lack of evidence doesn't mean that it's definitive. <laughs> that, like, right. we, we're not studying, right? We're, we're trying to study things that, what can we do once somebody lands in the ICU? And, you know, I've been working with um, a, a group to aggregate information on how do we make sure people don't get to the ICU? How can we actually be as preventative as possible? And so much of what we see comes down to, exactly what you're saying, what they did in uh, Korea, what they did in China. And I want to highlight for people to understand, because I do want to ask you about what you're doing and what your family's doing and talk about that. But to understand that in traditional Chinese medicine, it is individualized. And so it is very hard to study what one thing works for everyone, because that's not how it works. And that's not how naturopathic medicine works either. It's very individualized and tailored to what this person needs. And so I just want to say that before I ask, so what are you doing personally? And what are you doing with your family? Because yeah. you've got your whole family quarantined in your house. <laughs> well, well, thankfully, it's not my whole family. I have a big family, but it's a lot. Yeah, of, well, yeah. uh, <laughs> you might hear some actually, if, if we wait long enough. But um, so yeah, a couple of things I think are really important. So just to, sh to tag on to what you said, e even in the Chinese expert guidelines, the first ones that came out that are only a few days old, when they talked about traditional Chinese medicine, they're very in favor of it for both the preventive and, and recovery phases. And they do say that, you know, obviously, they know that it's uh, personalized, it's individualized, just like our naturopathic medical approaches, or the Korean approach, or Ayurveda, or anywhere. Mm -hmm. But what I hear, and I do want to say this from because it, it opens up options for people, what I hear from people, whether they're in areas where it's more Ayurvedic medicine or Chinese or Korean or, or traditional kind of Western botanical medicine, whatever, almost any of them work for the preventive and recovery phases. And it, they work not so much because of which things you're doing, but they work because someone is looking at you or at least talking to you through some means and saying these are your problems and we're going to focus on these things to strengthen you and so you, we get the same reports from people in you know india using traditional means there in china mm -hmm. yeah, and, and here you know with with indigenous medicines etc so i think it's important for people to know if you work with someone who knows what they're doing in their area it will help you on those mm -hmm. preventive and the other ends our family, um, we, uh, so what we, my wife and I are here, um, and we have two of our five adult children here, and then uh, between them, three of the grandchildren. There's six total grandchildren, seven soon, I'm told. Three generations, one yeah, house, so <laughs> surviving quarantine. Of, uh, we've, we've got to talk about, like, you know, how you guys are staying active. That, yeah, that is a conversation the, for another day. The special, <laughs> psychological toll of it. <laughs> One, one one real positive is we we did move to a larger house because our family is getting larger, not smaller, uh, and uh, we we live near a park, so we're able with with social and personal distancing to get to the park, and uh, the children can work the kinks out easier that way. So that's yeah. actually, um, but um, what we're doing, and again, these are just this this is what I'm doing with my family because I know them and I know their history. If you hear any of these and get a great idea to do them, please talk to somebody who knows about these. Because the, the thing with even nutritional things and even some dietary things, they might be great for 98% of the people. And there's 2% where it's like, well, for you, that's not a great idea, right? Mm -hmm. so just, for our family, what I know to be safe and what we're doing um, is uh, we're, we're all taking some uh, vitamin A in its uh, fat-soluble form. So... Uh, like beta carotene carotenoids are the water soluble kind the fat soluble kind just you, you need less it gets into you it's uh it's fat soluble like vitamin d is we people talk a lot about vitamin d this time of year a and d in their fat soluble forms for many many reasons but one of them with vitamin a that that um we don't think about till we get really sick with certain things is Vitamin A only has particular places it works in your body. One is in your uh, lining of your respiratory system, mm -hmm. which we were talking about, you know, vitamin C gets burned out there. Vitamin A is not so much because it's fat soluble, it will build up. 
but many of us don't get enough long term and if you're sick you do start to use up the vitamin a so vitamin a actually helps with background the actual function of the cells in your respiratory lining well they are where your first defense is so that's mm -hmm. why it's important vitamin d uh i think you talk plenty about in vitamin d so we're doing a and d our vitamin D is, has a little bit of vitamin K2 in it because D and K kind of go together. So that's how we do it. Um, and then we're doing vitamin C kind of through the day like we're talking about. Now, we most of us are tolerant for regular ascorbic acid. Um, mm -hmm. but we just we have a big, actually a kilo of powder <laughs> and we put it in our water. Um, so A, D with a little K and vitamin C. Um, the other things that are super critical because they're also water soluble and they're used up really quick when your immune system is uh, vigilant or fighting are trace minerals. And the one mm -hmm. we use the most of is zinc. Yeah. But we also use selenium and other stuff. So what I normally tell people, like uh, I will usually take more pills than anyone else in my family will. Uh, and so I have to, like, I have to be thoughtful about the pill counts. Um, we have one daughter who beats me, actually, but outside of that. Um, so what I usually tell patients to do is get a good trace mineral so you get all of them. And you can find them that have decent amounts of zinc and selenium and stuff in them. If you're really um, exposed to a lot of stuff and maybe you're doing higher dose zinc through the cold and flu season, sometimes you add on a little bit to that of just separate zinc. But I like to have – it's kind of the same as zinc and vitamin C – Sometimes they, they don't work exactly in the same place, but they work in the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And they both get hit hard during this time of the year. So one of the things zinc does, it's the same as the vitamin C story, is your um, your first responder immune cells, some of them use a lot of zinc. And they're nonspecific, but they keep they keep most of the junk out so you don't get sick every day during the winter. They use up zinc the more you're exposed. And so... Mm -hmm your zinc levels drop. One of the things that we're finding out, the CDC is actually talking about this a lot. You can go to the CDC and they have these really great videos and this really smart people. One of the things they're talking about now is, oh, it turns out zinc on the inside of cells will stop viral replication. Now mm -hmm. it's great to get zinc inside, but oh, well, zinc maybe is more important than we thought in the past. Well, so zinc is for nonspecific first responders, but also it will slow down viral replication of certain types in your cells. So think about it. If you've been exposed to a bunch of stuff and your zinc levels are dropping, just like vitamin C, and then you get something bad, um, you're in, you're in a, better, a better place for that to take advantage of you. So we're doing, you know, zinc and trace minerals. Um, yeah. And I will also say for people to understand that without zinc, Vitamin A has a harder time doing its job. And so that's the other reason why we can't just look at one single nutrient and be that myoptic because they all work together. Um, it's much, it's like I explain hormones. It's like a symphony and symphonies yeah. don't work unless everybody's on point. Yeah. 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 There, there's, there's a lot of orchestration with everything and nutrients are that way too. So <clears throat> while you might, do more vitamin C or more zinc or more of these other things during cold and flu season. It is important to remember that they all play off of each other. So it's important to, and that's why it's important to work with someone who knows about this stuff because they can tell you, yeah, that was fine for three months, but really, you know, for long term, we should rebalance what you're doing um, mm -hmm. because, because of this orchestration. So if you, you know, yeah, if you're, in the middle of, you know, putting a fire out, use way more water, you know, to put the fire out than you would ever use for any other purpose. That doesn't mean you need all that water all the time, right? So yeah. you, you want to, you know, go back to some balance afterwards. But that's kind of the basics of what we're doing. Um, and then people always get really, uh, well, some people get concerned or interested about, well, what, are you taking herbs or other, you know, natural things? Um, and the answer is yes, but we all kind of have a little different thing that we do. And like I was saying earlier with respect to, say, traditional Chinese or Western herbal medicine or Ayurveda, it's more about the balance of it and what's right for you. You know, mm -hmm. as a, this herb is the only one you should take <laughs> or don't yeah. take this one or whatever. You know, and for some uh, for some of us here uh, in, in my quarantine house, that's uh, there's certain mushrooms uh 
for oh, sure. I was going to say, are you are you sipping on turkey tail and cordyceps we're, uh, and we're, we're reishi doing, like we are? <laughs> yeah, we're we're doing uh, we're both both in what we're eating, uh, and also in in the supplements. There's uh, there's there's both mushrooms coming in. So yeah, uh, and then uh, some other things. Now with we have because of the grandchildren, uh, children sometimes are a little picky about what they will and won't take. And there's a lot of herbs taste like dirt or words. <laughs> Um, or worse. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I, you know, my five children grew up taking things that they were really displeased with, and most of them are fairly normal. But what we found with the children uh, for prevention is the, like the elder uh, extracts actually don't taste too bad because it's, yeah. et cetera. And there's other things you can get that are like that, that, that a child will actually take. Yeah, the um, glycerite base kind yeah. of go. I hate glycerite base. I, ugh. but my kid. Yeah. Um, the yeah. other thing I'll say too is yeah. that um, <laughs> Dr. Maya should treat. I actually adopted a recipe from her book Dirt Cure on making. I make reishi truffles. Mm. So <laughs> those I will get into my kid, and I'm like, you're getting chocolate truffles. I'm like with reishi because <laughs> reishi is not. It's not always so palatable. Yeah, we. <laughs> yeah, we we have. Uh, Interestingly, and I think it's her, her brain telling her this, one of the pickiest eaters in the grandchild universe here um, w craves mushrooms, actually. Mm -hmm. We always have them around. They're not unusual food in our house. And so yeah. we kind of let her decide. But like when she goes into a mushroom phase, she'll sit and that will be most of her meal, you know, mm -hmm. and, you'll, and, and it's like, well, okay, that's great, you know. And yeah. for the other ones that don't like it i i hide them in other things that i know they will eat because there's ways yeah. to do that so well yeah. whole mushrooms i think are those do the, my kid will he has no problem with those and if people saw i was going through a kitchen remodel and i was still making like lion's mane frittatas in my toaster oven and um mushrooms i think the whole mushrooms are a little bit easier and you can also hide them into things the powders like we have tons of mushroom powders from our friends at super feast um that we have with teas and things like that and if you guys watching don't know my my child has pandas which is an autoimmune condition that causes inflammation in his brain so it's non-negotiable for us to not be on immune supportive things and when we say immune supportive that's not immune boosting that's not a good idea for this kid so what what you're actually talking about what we're talking about they're more immune modulating. They're more immune supportive so that if your immune system needs to throw down, it's got what it needs to be able to do that. There yeah. were some questions just about when to take these things. Um, I do want to say with zinc, if you take it on an empty stomach and you have a sensitive stomach, you're, you're not, you're not going to like it. So taking yeah. zinc with food, fat soluble <laughs> nutrients, better absorbed with food um, as well. And then with the vitamin C, like you were talking about, that's something you can take throughout the day, depending on the form it may or may not upset your stomach yeah. and to really troubleshoot this of what is best for you meet with a healthcare practitioner that can support you on an individual level. Um, and there's people saying like that. Yeah, they're doing the reishi cordyceps turkey tail. I'm like, whatever I can do to support my immune system right now. Um, and my adrenals at the same time, I'm like, I need the two for one mm -hmm. with the amount of stress in this. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, I think that's super important, like whether it's um, the mushroom families, most of them, or certain other herbs that are known as quote unquote immune herbs, most of the things we think of, especially in popular uh, writing and posts about immune herbs or mushrooms, etc., you think of it, oh, it's going to like force my immune system to work harder or whatever. Mm -hmm. Most of what those do actually, it's it's like instead of way up or down, it's kind of like a sine wave. It's like they go in, they increase um, uh, your activity of certain things, and then they go back down. Now, increasing the activity of certain things chemically <clears throat> if there's somebody to kick out, they will help kick it out then because it sort of gives this little burst of wake up everybody, but it doesn't mm -hmm. like going up and, you know, cause there's people posting about, well, don't take any mushrooms cause it'll raise this chemical and that causes death. Well, no, or elderberry. Not, not you're seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I'm like, like, where's the study that's shown us that any like of these this. things push the cytokines yeah. to that degree? Like it just, it's right. not it's, the way that they work. 
it's not. And if you actually look up, there's like immunologists have studied many of these things. If you look up what kills you in influenza, like a, you know, like swine flu or, or uh, H5N1 or something, it's this much of the chemicals. If you look up what the herb does, it's like this much right here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's literally, and it's like this. Influenza or another virus, is, it's like all the time. That's where, but they read it and it's like, it's apples and orange, you know, comparison. Um, I did see something float through because my name was on. I'm not good at reading these things, but. Um, was it the question so question? Is the question in one? Yeah, <laughs> so, I was going to ask you it. <laughs> now, one of the problems that's come up is, uh, Quercetin, not just because of me, but Quercetin got kind of famous because people were looking at it to help the zinc get in the cells. And uh, so it's real hard to get sometimes right now. And uh, even if, like, you go on Amazon, the, now they're making you bid on Quercetin. It's like, I, I, it's crazy. It's getting um, crazy. It's, like... it's, it's getting very, very, people are like, I don't know, it's like when the housing market's hot, they're bidding, they're outbidding each other on Quercetin. Yeah. If you have quercetin and you can get it, it's it's it, it's we use it a lot. We think of it like for allergies and other stuff. Which, if you think about allergies, that's an overreaction. It's kind of calming things down. But the thing that quercetin does that they've studied for viruses, especially this type of virus, is it helps the zinc actually. That's just me dinging. I put on the do not disturb. Right. Don't worry about it. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I thought we did something wrong. No, um, no, no. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> a, okay. Uh, so what, what the quercetin also helps to do, so it's an immunomodulator for the most part, but it helps to get the zinc in your cells so mm -hmm. that it can do the interference. So uh, quercetin's good, like, you know, kind of like zinc works on a nonspecific and specific way. Quercetin works all over your body. And most people tolerate it. It's just not a blanket recommendation, but that's why people are taking quercetin right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other one they studied, uh, so, sometimes they study them together, was the green tea extract, EGCG. Yeah. And um, it it does the same thing. And there's, there's other natural substances, but those are two of the safest ones, mm -hmm. um, unless you don't tolerate green tea or something like that. So... Um, those are very important also. And again, these are like, the way I look at it is the stuff grandma told you to do like sleep and hydrate and eat good. Yeah. And then dietary ways to get more flavonoids and vitamins and minerals and then do supplements and stuff mm -hmm. with somebody who knows what they're doing, uh, which is the most important thing. I think the most important way to do it because then you've got a foundation to put stuff into. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to understand that you can be eating these things. So you can be, I mean, we're drinking nettles tea every day as part of a blend that's going to deliver some quercetin. When we look at research and we look at the therapeutic doses that generally comes in a supplement form, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to jump on a supplement right now with all of this. So just to, uh, just the one last thing, which there yeah. was the comment, um, yes, if you take too much zinc and no copper over a long period of time, it'll deplete your copper. What we're talking about is short term for extra, or that's why I recommend people do a trace mineral blend. Mm -hmm. You're going to balance it. I just want to say thank you so much. Where can people follow you, find out more about you, and stay up to date with all of the great information you're putting out? Um, so since we're on Instagram right now, it's just D-R-A, Dr. A, online. So just D-R-A, online, all one word. Um, you know, on uh, Facebook, if you put in uh, D-R period A online, you'll probably find me. Uh, and on Instagram, it's Dr. Paul Anderson and the number one, because there's lots of Paul Andersons in the world. Uh, so just D-R-A online on, uh, on Instagram, and you'll find all the rest easily enough. Right. And then they can also find, you have a website? Yeah, for, so for practitioners, and now there's a little more public info on their uh, consult, again, dra, dra.com, consult.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's there's a number, it's, it's more practitioner facing, but there's a lot more information. If people want to view the international IVC update that we did for the whole world, uh, it's free. We, we all donated to do it. It's, it's on the, it's right at the top of the page. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing. So there's a lot on there. Yeah. So for practitioners, Dr. A, uh, consult.com. You guys can follow him here on Instagram. If you want to stay up to date 
about what is going on with vitamin C, with natural therapies, and also how the hospitals are getting updated in their protocols. And I definitely want to encourage you to follow him. So tons of people saying thank you, you guys. If this was helpful for you, light it up with some hearts, show him some love, and definitely give him a follow on Instagram. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day and stay safe. All right, you too. All right. Bye. bye.